now we have a big challenge now. Uh, we have, I think, five, six, seven remote participants at the moment. I'm not sure if they can hear us yet. Let us know when they can hear us. And to some extent, it would be unfair to start the workshop if those people cannot hear us. But because we are on the workshop about remote participation, we all want to be equal, right? But let's start discussing among ourselves, as I'm sure they will be discussing among themselves as well, in, in, in that part of the space, and we'll try to link the two spaces. Now, um, first of all, I want to remind you that this is the second round of this workshop. The first round of this workshop was basically, this is the third round of this workshop. The first one was in Nairobi two years ago, where we wanted to draft the e-participation principles. So what should be the main principles of e-participation? And we started with collaborative drafting of the document back then, which means all of us in the room basically did the draft. And we repeated that in Baku, improving this draft last year. And this year we, wa we want to um, somehow wrap up this process and complete the e-participation principles for the IGF. And here is the document, and I'll try to go through and just give it away, a copy of, of each for everyone. Ah, you might have it, or you can take it. So that you can pass through and maybe read while we are discussing it. Oh, you can distribute, thank you. And at the same time, and one copy over there. But you have the, the iPad, right? Or, or the pad. <laughs> okay. And one hard copy here, please, <laughs> to her. Uh, but all of you that have laptops or any kind of gadgets, Instead of reading your emails and browsing the web at this session, which I know everyone does, I invite you to open this link. Because this is the link to the current version of the document. And when you are going to be required to answer, uh, insert the password, this is the password you insert, which will help us draft this document together, collaboratively, during the session. Now. Can you see it? You can't see it. Uh, let me see. I can probably show it here. Here it is. Okay. Thank you. So some more copies are here if I, anyone wants. So here is the link, and I encourage you to open the document. And uh, the folks that are in remote space uh, will do the same. So we'll have... I know that Ginger should be somewhere with us in the remote space. Ginger, who is basically behind this whole initiative for two years already, three years. And uh, she should be the one who's um, editing the document as well and helping the remote coordination. Deirdre is with us also today, who is um, uh, remote moderating and connecting the two spaces. Uh, so we'll try to interact. I don't know how technically this is going to work, but that's also one of the the points of, of our exercise today. Um, to start with, I would like to emphasize the importance of the remote participation. And unfortunately, not many of us really realize it. We have like 20 people in the room and another seven people online. But this is yet another step. So we hope that uh, we'll manage to persuade and explain to all the others that remote participation is very important and that it's a complex process. Now, I wanted to start maybe with some of you uh, to ask a question to some of you. Um, you probably feel, all of you that are here, you feel that you're participating in, in this workshop. So you feel that you're at the IGF, right? Do you think that Ginger, who is now online, is also at the IGF? Who thinks that Ginger, who is online now, is also at the IGF? Does it mean that those people that are not physically present are not participating in the IGF? To what extent this physical presence is important? As, as the editor was put, uh, would put it, what is here? 
is here if we are here physically or is here if we participate? And do we need to participate on, as the diplomats would say, on equal footing? Or any kind of participation should be considered, okay, that's fine enough. They can follow, they can read, they can hear maybe. That's fine. Maybe they can even write and send, send something. That's fine. Uh, Deirdre, did we manage to, or Fazanek, did we manage to make the voice go to the remote space also? Uh, yes. Not yet. Okay, working on that. Working on that. Um, this is the this is the the goal of of the exercises. So to try to build up these e-participation principles. Now to start with, uh, maybe we can put. I don't know if if it is too complex to put the video now. Uh, Ginger's video on, huh? Ginger's video. Is it okay? We can put Ginger's video. Yes, Deirdre. And Ginger says, in reply to Vlada's question, which proves that she's here okay. or at the IGF, Ginger and others are definitely at the IGF, but it does not feel the same as yes. same the other way around with no video and audio. Well, I mean, since Ginger is in Wisconsin and it must be freezing over there, it definitely doesn't feel the same way as here. Yep, wait, 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 but we need a, we need a tone. Now, stop it <laughs> and then try to put the, the, the tone on. Uh, this, is, this is the video. This is a pre-recorded video. We're not going to... F to, to uh, to pull your leg. The point was when I asked Ginger if she wants to jump in, if she wants to jump in with a remote video or with a pre-recorded video, she said, "No, no, I want a pre-recorded video because I want also to show that remote participation needs a lot of preparation, and it's a serious process, and you need to have a backup. So if the things doesn't work as it happens here, we have a chance to say what we wanted to say even through the video message." So she pre-recorded a video message. You see, she was very afraid that we are not, go not going to put it uh, in spite of her efforts. But anyhow, we will put her uh, short message ab about the principles where she explains why the principles are important. Now, let me see if we can put the voice on. multilingual support to non-native English speakers, ensuring equality. Hello, everyone. The IGF Remote Participation Working Group e-participation principles, which had their beginnings in a workshop at the 2011 IGF in Nairobi, Kenya, continued in a collaborative online edit at the 2012 IGF in Baku, Azerbaijan and will reach a final draft here at the 2013 IGF in Bali. This collaborative document is to be edited during this workshop using the link that Vlada has just given you. As we speak, I will be adding my suggestions for new principles emerging from this eighth IGF. The draft includes principles on promoting inclusiveness, offering multilingual support to non-native English speakers, ensuring equality of participation between in situ and online participants, 
dedicating remote moderators as an integral part of panel and workshop design. Building capacity and developing guidelines with clear dissemination of training materials and information. And providing multiple platforms and media web conferencing, for example, webcast, chat, Twitter, and social media, that are easily accessible for all, including those with disabilities. As remote participation has evolved, we have become more demanding. I have two new principles to suggest, principles that have not been raised previously, and I hope we can discuss them here. First, time zones of meeting venues and compensating strategies should be considered to make sure they foster effective remote participation. The 13-hour time difference, for example, between Wisconsin, where I am, and Bali, makes participation in this IGF very difficult for me, and others, I'm sure, find themselves in a similar situation. I now better understand and more fully appreciate the challenges facing people from the Pacific time zones as they work with the rest of us online every day. One online strategy that could ameliorate the time zone challenge somewhat is to schedule workshops at more reasonable times, times that would facilitate more participation, perhaps the earliest and latest sessions. Another possibility is to schedule programmed asynchronous discussions, which could offer input to in situ sessions. My second suggestion is that remote presenters should be given equal footing with in situ presenters and panelists. What could be worse than preparing a presentation, perhaps even pre-recording it and arranging to be online at an inconvenient time, only to find that the moderator does not include your presentation in the panel because in situ events have taken precedence. This has happened in the past and already seems to be even more prevalent at this IGF in, new, in the numerous panels we have had so far. This is an issue that must be addressed. I hope to see you on the document shortly, editing with me. Please take the time to comment. Your input is very important. Have a great IGF. Well, thanks for Ginger. Now I'm, I'm, I'm thinking again, trying to put a, the link for some more time so that if any one of you wants to join again uh, the document, you can do that. Uh, trying to think if I, we should add as one of the challenges what we had at the beginning of this meeting, uh, should we wait for technical problems to be resolved before we start a physical workshop or not? That's probably also one of the challenges because if the remote participation doesn't work, the in-situ workshop just goes on and nobody cares about remote participants. Now, the focus of this session today should be not as much on specific details of remote participation as about the e-participation in general and the participation between the, process, between the two meetings, specifically the IGF meetings. Um, I, we wanted to hear this time a couple of people who had experience with e-participation, with involving people, with involving people into the process, into the political process uh, through the e-tools. And I'll maybe start with Deborah, and I'll try to find a microphone for Deborah. Well, I'll just give you mine to give us some experience. Or what what your thoughts are about how to involve? civil society or any other into the IG process and I don't know if you had a chance to go through the through this uh, uh, first set of principles but if not then we encourage you to read through and give us our feedbacks hello yes it's working um, thank you very much I I have had a chance to look through the principles and I guess I was asked to focus more on internet policy making through e-participation and was going to give my experience e-participating in ITU processes and the WISIS process, because as we all know, the IGF is wonderful, but is not policy making. Um, so I've had the experience of participating through the ITU, as I said, 
And of course, the time difference between New York, where I'm based, and Geneva is, is a problem. But one thing I noticed recently is that now more and more we're seeing governments actually e-participating. And in my experience, when there's governments that are participating remotely, there's a lot more emphasis on giving speakers the floor and making interventions. And the ITU actually has done a quite good job of making e-participation um, available and being responsive, and they've had very, very good moderators. So that's one aspect I'd like to share, is I think maybe these principles, once they're more finalized, they seem to be in pretty good shape, but once uh, the working group is in a position to bring them forward, maybe bringing them to governments and intergovernmental organizations to get buy-in, because one of the big problems in internet governance is the capacity of developing countries and small countries to actually go to every meeting and to engage when they need to, and they're more and more using remote participation. So I think if you could bring these principles to governments to get their buy-in and also to intergovernmental organizations or any fora that you want to participate in, that might be a good way of bringing them forward and to actually having these be met by governments, and not necessarily once they're published, but when, they're, when you're in a place where you're comfortable with them. And then second, I've noticed um, when I'm in person, at these meetings, a lot of my colleagues, like people in the ABC network and elsewhere, are not there. And I found what's very effective is to find other ways of social, like using Skype or different types of communication to actually bring them into the discussion and then be able to share their concerns um, when the people in the, in the meeting actually have a voice. And that's, that's not ideal because obviously the institution that's hosting the meeting should make that available, but sometimes it's the most effective way of actually getting others um, who are not able to come in person to participate. So I think I'll stop there. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and looking forward to seeing how this discussion advances. Well, maybe one, one question straight away. Um, since you're involved in the policymaking processes and following your participation, do you have the impression that the governments or whoever is, the institutions behind policymaking processes do really understand the importance of e-participation, or it's more kind of, a, kind of a bumper sticker, yes, we have it, yes, we involve people, but they don't really feel that this is involving people, they don't feel, they really feel the merit of that, they don't, they don't really devote to doing that. I think, I think I'm going to take the easy way out. I think it's a bit of both, depending on the venue. Um, when it's an intergovernmental meeting and they want to say they're multi-stakeholder and inclusive, They'll put, multi, they'll put remote participation in place, but when governments are on the other end, they actually feel they need to, and they need to be able to have every country make an intervention if they, if they request to. And most recently, I was on a meeting with, um, with the Saudi delegation um, at the ITU on remote participation. And if you're familiar with that particular delegation, they're very vocal, they are asked a lot of questions, um, you know, they really want to be involved. And I think that the moderators uh, were able to, to accommodate them, but that was something new and maybe not something that they've seen as much. In other venues, um, like the WISIS Forum, the annual forum, I think that you know, they genuinely do want to include, um, include remote participation. And I think the last, um, last year's forum was the first one where they really did that and had people making presentations from remote, remotely. And I think it's something they're proud of. I don't know if they see the value in it inherently or just see this is something that sounds good and seems good and are, are very proud of it. So it's hard to say, I think, when it comes down to decision making, they don't see, it's more of a, a sticker that they can say, okay, we were multi-stakeholder, because often it's civil society pushing for, for remote participation, but more and more if governments do, I think it's gonna become more of a necessity. I ask because I have the impression that uh, not only at the IJF, also some regional IJFs and so on, that, that it is a good thing to have special remote participation to show it, but then not many people really realize how complex this process is between the events, how complex it is to organize uh, human resources, time, finances, and so on, to really make it work, especially in between the two events. So that it's not only about the remote participation at the event. Now, uh, if you want to add something, or Emila, you might want to, to add to this, what are your um, experiences with, with remote participation in these kind of processes? Hi everyone, my name is Emila Ushe and I work with the Association for Progressive Communications uh, and I'm based in South Africa. Uh, APC is both uh, a network and an organization and we have 46 members in 33 countries and our staff members um, 
are based in 16 countries. So we do most of our work online. And um, our experiences uh, have been that um, e-participation is, is not only about technology, it's, it's about people. And we, what we have tried to do is um, to build the capacity of um, our members and, and, and staff uh, who we uh, work on projects with. You find that um, we, we, we have challenges even in uh, staff because we are not all based in, um, we are based in different countries, mostly uh, Global South. And you find that um, some of the challenges that we have, uh, even on connectivity uh, issues, uh, on being able to uh, actually uh, being conversant with uh, technology, being able to use the technology tools that you have. So you might want to work with someone on Skype or meet with someone on Skype, but they might not be able to actually use it or they or their connection is very expensive. So for APC, uh, what we have done is to allocate resources to build capacity of not only our staff members, but also our mem not only of our staff, but also our members. And we have held uh, the first African IGF with our um, partners in South Africa to build the capacity of our partners to be able to participate meaningfully, uh, not just offline, but also electronically. I, I take two uh, important obstacles from there um, that you mentioned. One is the knowledge, capacity to, to manage with that and to know how to participate. And the second one is, is the technology, the, the bandwidth, right? Uh, how can that be solved? Okay, the capacity, that means that you need to train the people. That's one thing. But how do you overcome the problems of technological nature, like the bandwidth? Would any kind of a text-based communication help? Uh, even like social media, but then there are the obstacles when it comes to, to people with disabilities, like blind people that might not be able to read it. Do you have any experience with that? Do you have any, any kind of a recommendation that we might build in the principles when it comes to overcoming these challenges? Um, yes, I have noted down some uh, recommendations. Uh, what, what I'll say firstly is, um, until we have uh, more universal uh, broadband, we cannot achieve inclusiveness. We cannot achieve uh, universal inclusiveness uh, because we might we, we end up just talking about it. But uh, if I don't have access to to the technology, there is no way that I can participate uh, in in this meeting. I have some people that I know that want to participate, but. Uh, they don't even have the basic connection or the basic access to, 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 to internet. And um, I've noted a bit of uh, recommendations. And maybe we, when we do uh, the, I don't know how we are going to do it, but maybe when we do the live editing or whatever, we can uh, add uh, some of it uh, on the document. On you can do it immediately. Yes. Okay. Just do it. Feel free to do. It. I mean, Ginger is catching some of the notes and putting inside she's mm. over there in the US uh, but but you and everyone else please do it yourself as well yes okay and on um, multi multilingual um, ensuring that we have i think i've seen something on uh, multilingual um, platforms or something like that i'm not sure how practical that is uh, unless we uh, list the languages that we work with uh, but uh, Multilingual, which languages uh, would we say these are the languages that we work with? I'm not sure how practical that is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's one of the one of the things that Ginger mentioned. The other one was the time zones. And I think that the network like APC probably has problems as, that, as well, like that, which is working across the time zones. So could some kind of asynchronous communication be possible and helpful in the sense of e-participation? Yes, we definitely have a, prob a challenge with time zones. I will give an example of our policy program where our policy manager is based in Ecuador. I'm based in South Africa. Uh, the rights manager is based in New Zealand, and we have some based in Asia. It's, it's quite a challenge, and maybe we have one platform, maybe one live platform where uh, 
we work with and a text one maybe one text based uh, platform that we can use uh, because as it is I think uh, I think there is uh, a suggestion in this document of having multiple platforms I think um, and I also am not sure about uh, having different platforms because as it is there are so many uh, platforms that we have to deal with um, as participants at the IGF uh, so maybe one uh, platform would be uh, it would be useful, and maybe having a mailing list. Yeah, uh, it's it's challenging always because some of the people would prefer to do it through social networks. Some of the people would prefer to do it Webex. Some people cannot use Webex. I don't know if we if if we ha if we have Dependra on on the call and if. If we can get him on, is he online now? Or I mean, can we? If Dependra is here, can he? Dependra, can you hear us? Can you jump in with the voice call? Let's see if we can get him in in the program. Dependra, can you can you hear us? We still can't hear you. Okay, maybe while, while we, we catch, catch up, up with the Pandora, we, we, we can move on for the moment, maybe with Andrea, until we, we catch up with the Pandora. And then we are back to the question of no matter how many multiple tools we may have, if some people are not able to use them, um, they are still excluded. That's, That's absolutely, absolutely correct, correct. And, and we're watching, watching this right now in this room of having a classic example of trying to do a patch or a makeshift method of, of getting blind, blind participants, participants to call in. in. It's, it's not, not working. working. And uh, in the past, we've managed in that kind of by the skin of our teeth to do this in previous IGFs, but the problem is deeper than that. Um, Manufacturers design their platforms as uh, one size fits all. Now, captioning has been included inside some of the, the uh, remote tools. We're using one in particular at the moment, but uh, there are others, and I've had a lot of experience with others. But it's not just that also. Um, blind people can't raise the hand to be able to comment. We have to train people who are moderators, people who are chairmen, on how to deal with multiple uh, disabilities with people who are going to be online. There are other problems. Um, if you have a captioning pod enclosed, it often blocks what else is there, not allowing other people to be able to use it, uh, the rest of the tools that are on there. Um, I, I actually have, have got a presentation in my own uh, area, in my own workshop, which is 38 tomorrow, where I go into greater detail. Do you have my picture? I'm going to put up a picture here of remote sign language interpretation and just show you another problem. Let's see if we can, what's going on. And Ginger, if you're listening to me, there is no mention of persons with disabilities in your document. I'd like to see that change. And I have two sentences for you while we're waiting for my, there, there's a picture. The picture is actually showing a young lady and I don't know how well it is viewed, but that is a sign language interpreter. And the man in the iPad is a deaf participant. Have you, can you see that there are three machines, one for the remote tool, one for the captioning? And the reason why there's three tools, which means it's duplicated at the deaf man's, that's actually Christopher Jones, one of the Dynamic Coalition members, and who also is a vice chair, is totally deaf, of the Joint Coordination Activity on Accessibility and Human Factors, the group that I chair in the ITU. Um, he has exactly the same equipment. So you have six pieces of equipment for him to be able to participate. Not everybody can afford that. Um, the problem also, it deals with the fact that uh, 
if we do happen to have many participants, some of the other tools that are available, like Skype and everything else, do not allow um, what we would call conferencing with video without upgrading and buying another method of that particular tool so that even though you can have a conferencing tool that allows it with voice, they penalize per persons with disabilities. So manufacturers are going to have to learn to cooperate with each other and make these particular tools interoperable because then we will always know how to use them. Because if you cannot train a person who has a disability because he can't use the machine or the device, or that's one thing. If you don't have broadband, that's another thing. But if you cannot uh, have that person be able to use that uh, communication tool, the conferencing tool, transparently, how are you going to train them to use it in the first place? Um, I have a colleague here in the audience who I'd love to make some comments because we've been talking about this. But for Ginger, and I'd like him to make a comment, and I hope he will, um, we need to train moderators on how to deal with persons with disabilities. And uh, Deidre's hanging in there very well and gets quite a lot of this. But not every there's no program to train moderators to say to a blind person who has had to call in not going through the communication tool free on the web, but has to either have a toll-free number or to pay for the call or to be called back. Hi, and I'm going to use Jerry and Dependra as an example. Um, would you like to make a comment? Would you like to say anything? Now, this particular moment, we can't do it because it's not working. And allow them to speak. And it has to be a manual process, not one which is uh, technically done like using your mouse because when you have a blind person using it, he's using audio with his screen reader. You with me so far? And if he's listening to the meeting, he has to switch that off in order to navigate the page. He's missing the meeting. The question or the, er the area of discussion might just move on and he'll, he won't get there in time. It cannot be used for technical meetings. And we have blind engineers. There's a very famous one at Google called TV Ramen. There are people who are in industry who do have disabilities who function at a very high level. And they would not be able to use it as it stands now. Um, the other thing, other than the fact that we need to redesign these tools, which is going to take a long time, we have to set up in advance in a way that we know that these people are coming on to the possible remote participation platform. And that is when we register to say, do you have any special needs? Can you use the remote participation tool? And that should be on every registration form that exists for every meeting that is going to use remote participation. I hope Ginger is taking the notes on Ginger this. Ginger knows me. Ginger's taking it down. And I do see that there's somebody raising their hand. Should I stop and allow that comment to go through? Uh, I think also we have Jerry now on the, on the, on the connection. But let me hear from the other first. In fact, the hand is Ginger's to say that she has already put Emila's comments about people with disabilities into the etherpad and that she would be very happy to have your wording, Andrea, to better state what you would like to say. Ginger, you know I'm dyslexic, so we have the captioning and I will get a copy of it, and I will go over and do this, but I'm not able to add wording at the, I have a disability, able to do this live. But I promise I will go through and do that with her and go through, and in fact, I'll send her my presentation, which is going to be tomorrow, which will also deal with that. Did you want to try uh, Jerry or yes. Dependra? Yes, I think I'll just note one of the things that you mentioned, which is, when you apply for remote participation, you should be able to say what you can use and what you can't use out of these tools. And I think Ginger can take a note, or anyone of you can take a note of that. I think it's quite a, a relevant point for the for the principles. Now, uh, Jerry Ellis should be with us. Uh, he's is uh, on the phone because he's blind. He cannot use this typical WebEx system. I don't know if Jerry can hear us and if he, if he can jump in. Jerry, can you hear us?
Hello, Can you hear me? Jerry, can you hear us? Hello. Jerry, I think, I think we, we, we hear you. Um, we want to hear about your experiences of remote participation uh, and, and the tools and also the, the methodology of including people that cannot necessarily be able to use all of the, the tools that are, let's say, standard today. Can you hear me? Uh, hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone in Bali. I'm Dublin in Ireland. Jerry Ellis here. Uh, hope everything's going you. Uh, from such a far distance, where we're seven hours behind you, so it's only uh, heading for eight in the morning here. In. Um, I found that I was only able to join the meeting there about five minutes ago because there were technical problems. But that did, I find that um, I could clearly hear it there. I couldn't understand what gentleman was in that space. Can you hear me? Sure. You understand it better, but maybe more her voice. I heard problems, and this morning I tried to phone in, and I tried to use the dial-in option from the website, and I tried to uh, use the join using my computer for audio, and none of them worked. So, despite all the best efforts of Diplo Foundation and the organizers of the workshop, and Firesnet uh, and everyone else. Technology is a difficulty, and I will leave you with one thought. The only way to overcome those difficulties is to test in advance and ask the user. And it's the same as we say about universal design or any other design for uh, products or services. The real experts are the, are the users with disabilities. So I would say ask them first. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, Jerry. Jerry. Uh, it, the connection was really, really bad, but we managed to hear bits and pieces. Now, this also helps us get a picture of how complex this is. One of the things that I think I've heard, and I think I, I definitely agree, is the necessity to test all the tools way ahead so that we are sure that, that, uh, that the tools can work and the people can be effectively involved in the discussion, right? Um, I wanted to maybe. Um, do you have any comments from from the from the remote? Um, Ginger could hear Jerry better than we could, and she has added his comments to the etherpad already. She might also be able to t ask her, or I can ask her. So, Ginger, if you if you can, just put up a couple of bullets back to remote space so that we can read them because our voice here was not as good as, as you could probably hear. So that we can maybe read back uh, uh, some of some of main Jerry's comments, right? Um, okay, now let me, let me try to, to move on this. Um, uh, I don't know, Andre, if you wanted to add anything. Can you wait a minute, let me turn it back just a minute here. Okay, it should be on. I muted it. This is something that we might want to do. On the bottom of your mic, you can mute it and then put it right back on again so we don't get the feedback, which might be causing some of the problem. I've been trained well by some very wonderful tech people uh, who always make us turn off our mics if we're not using them. Um, yeah, there's a lot more I'd like to add. Uh, one of the things that... Uh, is very important is not only do we need to include persons with disabilities, but we need to put them in every single document that we do and that they're acknowledged and that they're recognized. And we need to also uh, do a, write a guideline for moderators and a guideline for chairman on how to run a meeting. Because one of the things that happens um, is that when you're dealing with deaf people, for example, 
It takes time for sign language interpretation to transpire. If I have a deaf colleague who is participating remotely and we are speaking and for whatever reason captioning fails or he is actually signing to the person who is going to be speaking for him, it takes time. And he may choose to do several sentences before that person who is interpreting and voicing for him actually says it. One of the things that's happened is that people who do chair meetings don't have patience. They want to go fast. They want to get going. And I'm not saying you're doing that because you're not. You're great. But the point is we have to also remember, as I told you earlier, and you did beautifully, ask blind participants to speak and to answer questions or to give comments we have to do that manually. We cannot rely on the remote moderator to actually be able to do that. If they can't raise their hand, they can't use the chat box. And also this takes in people with physical disabilities. And perhaps one of the only ways we can actually do this and, uh, is to have different screens, and hopefully the people who design these uh, remote tools, where people can switch to the screen that applies to them. The blind have a different one. The deaf have a different one. You don't cover up the chat box or the document with a tool like captioning. And you also need captions to be able to be adjusted by people with visual problems. That means changing the color if you're colorblind. That means big, making the font bigger if you are physically, if you're sight challenged. That means being able to scroll up and scroll down if you have a learning disability so you can stop it and go and look what somebody said, put the scroll back on and then recatch up. Um, like I said, it's more complex than what I have said here, but we need to add these things to this document and I'll be happy to work with Ginger later and we'll do that. Thank you very much for the opportunity to say all those things. Thank, thank you, Andrea. I think, uh, again, a couple of things. I'm sure Ginger captured something of that. Uh, again, w w what, I, what I captured out of, out of um, your part was that, on one hand, there is technology which is challenging, but it's not only technology. It is also the people, the moderators, that are standing and connecting the two spaces that should be very skilled and educated or, or trained to do that. And I think one thing that is missing uh, in, in general, not only with when it comes to people with disabilities, is this link between the moderator and the remote moderator. Sometimes we get a remote moderator which is just, just sitting and reading, and that's not the point. Deidre, we have comments. Um, my first comment is that apparently we have no audio again, or the captioning doesn't have any audio. Um, these are Ginger's... Um, relaying Jerry's points that we couldn't hear very well, but she could. Platforms must be accessible by persons with disabilities. Registration for conferences and planning must include information about special needs of remote participants, as is done for in situ participants, for example, with wheelchairs. Adequate testing of tools and installations must take place live before the event. We must train moderators to deal with issues of persons with disabilities, as you've just said here. Interoperability of platforms for special needs must be addressed. It seems like the microphone was not okay. Oh. They couldn't capture. Read it again. Do you want to re read it again? Let me see. If okay. Going. Apparently we had an audio problem. So again, Ginger's comments from Jerry, platforms must be accessible by persons with disabilities. Registration for conferences and planning must include information about special needs of remote participants, as is done for in situ participants for example, with wheelchairs. Adequate testing of tools and installations must take place live before the event. We must train moderators to deal with issues of persons with disabilities. And interoperability of platforms for special needs must be addressed. Thank you. I'm glad this was, this was uh, captured. 
let me see if this one... Uh, okay, this one works. There is only the third microphone which seems doesn't work. I hope so. I'm waiting for them to go on with... Okay, again, this one doesn't work, so we have only one microphone. If you can help us find another microphone which works, we would really appreciate it. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. Uh, Marilia. Thank you, Vlada. This is Marilia Marcel from the Center for Technology and Society of the Tulio Vargas Foundation in Brazil, and also a Diplo Fellow. Um, I'd like to bring in a couple of points. I think I have been one of the first persons here in this group to, to talk about remote participation and to, to start with this idea of the coalition, the, the remote participation working group, and the, the hubs, and so on. But it was a long time ago. It was back in 2007, and a lot has happened since then. And I've been to many different IGFs and many different political spaces related to this process here, just like the CSTD, the CSTD working group on IGF improvements. And I've been through a lot. I heard a lot. And I'd like to bring in some, some political thoughts and uh, that maybe sound a little bit uh, tough or negative. I don't know the word. It's not really negative because it, it's constructive. Um, but I don't know a, a better word how to frame it in English. Um, but you asked a question in the beginning, which was, uh, are the remote participants in the IGF? And not all the people just raised their hands and you said, okay, so... Does it mean that they are not participating? And I don't think that the two questions are, are the same. I would not say that they are in the IGF. I would say that they are participating in some level. There, there are different levels of participation. You can hear what the people are saying here. You can signal that you have something to comment. Uh, sometimes you can follow the corridor discussions by Twitter, by Facebook, or by Skype or social networks and so on. Um, but there is a level of participation. When you grab someone outside this room and you have a political point to bring, you, you want something to come across to someone that you can do remotely. And frankly, in, in conferences like this, this is really, really important. You know, to have the presence, to look someone in the eye, to, to make your points come across. So I would say that it's not the same that they're here in the IGF. And I think that it's dangerous if we frame like that. Because I think that there are many people in developing countries that try to find the resources to actually be here. So if we go on with the narrative that it's the same, then the donors and the people that are offering fundings may just say, okay, so you can participate remotely. Isn't it the same? So why are you requesting funding to be here? So I think that we need to be careful on, on how we frame it. And another thing that I would like to comment on is that I think that we have come far politically with remote participation. Um, this was something that on the report of the remote, uh, on the IGF improvements working group in the CSTD, it was recognized as an integral part of the IGF. And everybody came you know, to defend it really strongly. And it has, it has been something that has politically legitimized the IGF and the IGF secretariat on the face of other UN organizations as well. So I think that people understand it is important and we have created a culture that it's polite that moderators ask, okay, are there any remote participants? You are well seen if you ask this question. So like in terms of social protocol, it has become a considerate and beautiful thing to ask. But have we really conveyed the message that it is important to have remote participation in terms of inclusion? I'm not really sure about it. Because people who are here may say, okay, it would be a great thing to do, let's do that. But they are here, so they won't get politically involved in pushing for it. So who are the people that we need to bring on board for this to be not only politically important, but also to have the resources to be implemented? Because this was something that we really said in the working group. It's not just, okay, let's have it. You need to have the re resources to do it. And Frankly, we almost did not have the resources to hold this IGF. It was almost canceled. So how we as a community that believe that this is a key cornerstone for complete inclusion can help to secure funding for it inside this process that we don't know where it's going, and how we can convey the message that it is not only important for inclusion, but it has to be you know, secured for. And 
I don't know if, if, if we should, some ideas just, just crossed my mind. If we, maybe we could talk to someone who's really meaningful and important and form a political coalition to raise the topic and try to, to, to secure resources for it. I, I was thinking about WIPO. People wanted to approve the treaty for the blind and it, they brought Stevie Wonder to the meeting, you know? <laughs> no, if, if you approve the treaty, then Stevie Wonder is going to sing, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's silly, it's, it's very silly, but it's something that on the political level, <laughs> sometimes it works. So who is the person that we could bring in to a coalition pro-remote participation here? Maybe Julian Assange that can go anywhere, <laughs> so he has to participate remotely in everything. I don't know, just, just throwing ideas, but well. You know, very, good, very good points when it comes to, uh, to uh, the first part. Uh, I, I definitely can't agree more that it, it still is not the same being here physically and not being here physically. After all, we are, we are in Bali and they're not. And, uh, and uh, secondly, when it comes to what, what you say about resources, uh, today we had a, a discussion on MAG meeting as well about e-participation. And the fact is that within the last year and a half that I've been serving in MAG, we had hardly managed to have remote participation seriously discussed. And even on the agenda, okay, it was on the agenda, but it was mostly updates where we are, not really many people were interested in that. That's why I say I still get the impression that people do not understand uh, beyond, as you mentioned, uh, that that's, that, that would be polite to ask for remote participants and so on, but not more than that. And I'm not really sure, but I think your initiative should be something to, to follow up with. A couple of more comments, we are going back there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Dewey. I'm from Indonesia. And, well, Indonesia will become a pilot project for e-participation next year. And I'm glad that Indonesia has been chosen as a pilot project because we are the country who have a thousands of islands. And can you imagine even if we are just to uh, make connection between here and New York, you, we already spend hours, <laughs> I'm sorry, to be honest, <laughs> to make connection. And can you imagine how uh, the obstacle that we will face next year and uh, the following, following years if e-participation will become our uh, permanent program uh, by M our Ministry of ICT? My point was, uh, my point is, e-participation in policy making, process, pa process policy making. And then I'm wondering which process that we have to enter with e-participation. Is it in problem definition? Is it in uh, policy formulation? Or it is in implementation? Or it is in evaluation? There are a lot of uh, steps to make the policy, the public policy, and which step? And if in every step we have to uh, make e-participation eligible, then uh, how? For me, it's kind of like I'm from government, of course, and which is uh, I got uh, a lot of uh, complaint about how we are so close and not hearing everybody for making policy. But then the thing is, uh, when e-participation have to be applied okay. in making policy, uh, just a, a, a bit like uh, uh, to open like uh, everybody mindset that if you cannot participate in formulating po policy, then you can participate in implementing policy. We have a lot of process in making policy, and uh, uh, I mean, never uh, think that if you cannot uh, co participate in one step. It means you don't participate in whole step. So this is that I want to figure. And then I want in this uh, policy, uh, I, I saw that it is uh, CFI. And it's a kind of like uh, or this is the draft that you show me. And I want to, I want you to address this uh, point uh, to make the process of uh, policy making itself, and then uh, in how the e participation have to be applied in every process. Thank you for the comment. I'll definitely invite you to put this in yourself uh, directly in the document if you wish, because it's really precious if, if all of us want to do it. Uh, and uh, when it comes to, to the comment, I think it, it really goes well with 
with the agenda of this or focus of this session, which is um, the year-round participation, not only remote participation for the event per se, but e-participation throughout the year between the events and so on. And in that sense, a division into a couple of um, phases of policy making is really precious. And which tools, when, how, and so on. Can I give a priority to the, to the physical participation once, then to remote? But we are going back because he was first, and then I'm going back to remote. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, colleagues. Good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I just want to state that uh, I, I did not see this document before, of course, but uh, I think it is uh, what I have, I've seen the outline, it's good. And it should go beyond uh, really IGF. Because if you have, we need a good document on e-participation, whatever the field, whatever the place you are working. Because uh, uh, I'm from the UN, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And uh, from this year, whenever you are uh, planning to travel, they ask you the measures you have taken to reduce travel requirements. That means, is there a possibility to uh, do the workshop you are going online? Is it possible to use the technology to do it? Why are you traveling? Are there no other means? So I think this is, can be a good policy document and technical document also to be shared by uh, stakeholders. And uh, at ECA, we set up a task force uh, uh, called the Task Force on Knowledge Networking Strategy on significant reduction of face-to-face uh, -face workshops and meetings. And the objective was to unlock some constraint which can be financial because some people cannot travel and we are going to spend a lot of money on travel of, uh, to organize workshops. Political also, because some countries you are not allowed to go to a certain number of countries by while if you have your e-participation you can participate in any workshop anywhere you are. Of course, physical disability. Uh, some people cannot uh, spend uh, eight hours in a, in a plane or wherever they go also they are there are possibilities of, uh, don't have possibilities of uh, uh, having some facilities for the disabled, some countries don't have, and also to part provide larger participation, better inclusion, and finally to reduce uh, carbon emission, because we, we should participate in this. So uh, those were the objectives we had, and I think this objective can be also global. And the constraints, uh, as uh, Emilar has stated, so we found some constraints, because uh, institution running the e-participation should have the capacity. Because you just don't say that I'm going to reduce, but I have the capacity to do, do it is very important. And the capacity of the participants, as she has said, also, because the other side, she has to have all the facilities, possibilities, physical, intellectual, financial, to participate. Because it is not uh, something really uh, which is uh, given. Some other constraints also are cultural. There are some cultural constraints. Say, why uh, psychological? Why are they blocking me here to watch video or to participate through the internet while uh, somebody else is traveling? So those are blockades which also need to be, uh, to be looked into. And this leads to the resistance to the e-tools. Some people don't want to use the computers. They don't want to use the modern facilities and so on. And of course, we have the technological uh, constraints, the internet, which may be also not available in the country where this thing, we are asking for e-participation. Uh, I have a problem with the microphone. Let me see. Can you hear us? We lost the captioning. Can you hear us now? Okay, excellent. Now, I was not sure whether they are typing down themselves or whether they were transcribing me. Okay, uh, finally, the, the constraints uh, uh, may be also financial, as I said, because uh, the technology needs to be backed up by financial means to, to make, make it happen. So what we, uh, we, what we recommend is to really also uh, there is a, uh, the, the, the problems with the facilitators and moderators, because you need to have moderators who know how to moderate. It's not just a moderating a physical meeting. It's totally different. They have to be trained. They have to be fully trained to moderate using these platforms and this technology. And uh, also, uh, there is a need to put in place uh, uh, the resources which are required, financial, technological, and to partner with institutions in countries. Because all the people who are remaining, for, for example, in uh, my country, they cannot travel. 
I think the best way is to put them together somewhere in an institution with the facilities and they go there and they participate in the meeting. Uh, uh, because it's not easy that uh, everybody has a computer at home, have access to internet at home, but in an institution which uh, can pool their its resources or fund it, then they can participate. And if you look at the funding which was supposed to come, travel from Bali to West Africa and vice versa, then you know that uh, the resources can could be could be found. So I suggest also that a budget should be put in place. Really, we should look for a budget. The budget which is running a meeting, the budget which is uh, running a physical meeting, they should find now, start finding now a percentage of that budget to deal for remote participation. That is the only way. Because otherwise people would say, okay, I've used all the budget for the physical travel, but if there was a percentage, then we'll have part of it. And every year, every meeting, we have a percentage of it, and then we can uh, have uh, uh, e-participation. Finally, we need to sensitize also all the stakeholders on the benefits of e-participation. Because people think that they are blocked there because there is no financial resources. They have uh, been left behind because there are some people more important than them who have traveled. All this have to be done in a sensitization way. Thank you. Thank you, Makana. Uh, I guess Ginger captured some of the points, but since I see you have typed all of that, feel free to, to copy paste or, or fit in the document yourself. We can provide you again with a link and just add inside a document. Uh, and I think, you again, you, you helped us prove that, that the participation is way more than just a service, uh, which is usually observed as a service like anything else. You can just rent it, do it, and it's a piece of cake. But it requires uh, training. It requires serious approach. It requires funds, 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 and that's really true. We have two comments from remote. Uh, no, no, not necessary. Later on, later on. There is, a link, there is a link, so you can show maybe again the link uh, on a big screen. The, he knows. In the meantime, we, uh, we have two comments, right? Yes. First, I would like to say thank you to Jerry for his comments, even though we got them relayed through Ginger. Stephanie, reply to Vlada's comment on MAG not taking RP discussion seriously enough. Could it be that the people who can really make a difference are, lucky for them, able to attend most meetings in person and therefore unable to really appreciate remote participation? And from Guy, one point that has not been mentioned is language. In fact, to correct you, I think it was a little earlier. At the ITU, we are mandated to provide multilingual remote participation in the six official languages. Thank you. Well, we are basically moving to that. Cedric, what you wanted to comment? I just had uh, two points and one question. Uh, first, uh, about the remote participation. My name is Cedric Wachholz. I work for UNESCO. And in February of this year, we organized the WISIS Plus 10 meeting. And it was a new thing for UNESCO to have actually across 10 meeting rooms remote participation offered. We never did that b uh, before. And it's thanks to Diplo Foundation, but also Bernard Sadako here behind me, but also the IGF, which gave us licenses that it was possible. Um, so thanks to all of you. <laughs> and, uh, and it was quite successful because some 800 people uh, joined, I think, 2,900 times from 78 countries, uh, our different sessions. Then afterwards, you look at the different countries which participated, and it was um, in, from the 78 countries first, uh, China, France, United States, Uruguay, Brazil, Azerbaijan, Switzerland, Germany, United Kingdom. So we have still a lot of country from the global north uh, which participated in the high participation rate. So some points made before, uh, allowing uh, having enough bandwidth also to participate uh, were reflected there too. Um, I think uh, on that one, uh, I, I, I agree with the point made before. Um, a lot of the discussions uh, going on here uh, and the excitement at this IGF perhaps is also in the corridors. You can't necessarily see it always in the, in the official meetings. And in, in the discussions, is sometimes also, there are also moments outside in the corridors where you learn and this relational part is important. And in the, in the e-participation principles under equality of participation, there's a point 
which is the first one, e-participation is not about technology, it's about people. Relational participation that provides a social context is important. And I would perhaps invite afterwards other people to make me understand how this is really being done. Because I think that is really one of the weaknesses as I see it so far, that this relational uh, participation is not fully ensured, but perhaps I have not fully understood that. Just very briefly also on the second dimension, the e-tools you invited us to speak about as tools in between. UNESCO uh, hosts the WISIS dash community.org, a WISIS community with over 5,000 uh, participants or uh, subscribed participants in 27 communities. And, uh, and there also we can see how much effort it takes actually to first build up this community, uh, but also then to animate it. And I think uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's a lot of th uh, things you do not see uh, behind. And sometimes there is a question if you do these kind of things, if it is worth all these in investments, if there is little participation. It was certainly worse that for us, not only for the inclusiveness aspect, but also because of the success to doing it for WISIS plus 10. But these are enormous efforts, enormous resources, where we have little resources and we will continue doing it. Uh, and we were lucky and at WISIS plus 10, we had 1,500 participants, 250 from uh, Africa, and so on. we had a large geographical distribution. Um, uh, and we were able to invite and finance many people. But at one point, sometimes we could have in invited physically also many, many people. Uh, at sometimes it's a choice to be made in this. And we, we made it for remote participation, but it's of course easy when it works. So my question again is on the relational participation. If there are any examples on how to do that, um, I would love to learn about it. Uh, thank you. Um, what was again the website? WSS dash community dot org. Because I'm not sure if it was captured by the by the uh, transcribers and if if the uh, remote participants have heard. Uh, one specifically interesting thing that you mentioned is is building up the community, which is which is I think one of the precious ways of e participation in between the the events and crowdsourcing for discussions. I'll just briefly come back to that. For example, we build up, it is an open source platform. So for the WISIS plus 10 event, we did, for example, research, which we posted before, uh, where people then, uh, we did develop the platform further so people could edit it or comment on the documents. And all this was a big effort and so on, and honestly also on the recommendations uh, up front of the, of, the, um, of the meeting. And it was extremely little use. I mean, it was really uh, afterwards questionable, the investment. We had a few comments altogether, and we could have well received them per email and posted them somewhere else. So sometimes it's not all easy. Even with this big community where you have potentially a big reach out, uh, people thought it was perhaps not worth it at this point. But uh, anyway, we continue. Thank you. Uh, now, back on, on your question, and maybe the question for any one of you. So this difference, this social relation between the people, uh, can it be really established online? We can say that the corridor talks that we have here at the IGF can probably be done in the small rooms over there, or private chat, or whatever. But, but can we compensate somehow on this lack of ability to be face to face and even to some extent smell each other and see each other? Uh, can we compensate at least a little bit on that through the, through the online space? Does anyone have any experience on that? Okay. Well, um <laughs> What we are using at EC is a platform, uh, the processes we use uh, called Solution Exchange. Uh, what we do is not really to, to cancel all the face-to-face -face meetings because uh, there's a process where people should meet also. But it is to reduce the number of face-to-face -face meetings. And uh, you use a committee of practices as a, 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 a process which will lead to a physical meeting somewhere uh, in the year or the next year. Because, uh, as you know, we have, we have been meeting, uh, yes, so uh, what I say is that, uh, do you hear me? 
Yes, uh, what I said that uh, we are not uh, really going to to cancel all the meetings, the physical meetings. What we are saying on e-participation is to uh, make sure that uh, people will meet sometime, somewhere, uh, at the end of the process. But there are a lot of preparation which are uh, ongoing. As you know, we have the MAG meetings, we have other uh, WSCIS meetings, and so on. But the, 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 the f uh, physical contact you need to have with people to know who you are dealing with, in one time will happen. But it cannot be all the time you have to meet with people physically. That is really what uh, the aim of having this e-participation. And I think the context in which people meet, including the physical context, whether it is a beach or a bar or somewhere around, also matters. And you can't really make it different except in a second life, maybe, uh, online. Nina? I think we can take a shot at it. But in the case of e-participation, and for this particular one, uh, remote participation, we need a team not just of technical facilitators, but the human relation facilitators. W when we go to places, we want to see what you are looking like now. Have you added weight? Where are you coming from? Are you still jet lagged? Are there people sleeping in the room? What are you wearing? What is the food like? Who was there? Who, who did this? Who did that? So those are the sides that maybe Twitter can come in. We need the grapevine. You know, there was, a, there was a civil society meeting and there was a big fight. There was a government meeting and someone was sneezing. Those are the things that add life to it. And we can have a team do this other human part of remote participation. And of course, there are pictures for those who don't have large bandwidth, we need to take pictures of the funny moments, of the food itself, of the arrival at the airport, and add that. So it's not just the technical part for people to see the, tr the, the transcription and the video, but what happens after IGF at night. That is very important. Like the dinner of today, you can't remotely participate, but you can take pictures and upload them on an open platform so people can comment on those pictures. Thank you. Even though that can be endangering the privacy photos of the previous night and so on, but depends what's on the photos. Remote? Yes, remote. And a comment, I'm sorry. I was one of your 800 people from St. Lucia in the Caribbean, and I met this IGF the person who remote moderated my interventions from St. Lucia in Nairobi two, two years ago. Yes. We've never met before, but we met here. From Guy, a moment, please. In order to improve interaction between remote and physical delegates, we need to have a chat space that includes all meeting participants. And at the moment, remote delegates can chat between themselves, which they are doing currently on this channel, but are not able to exchange back channel views with physical delegates. Thank you. Um, we'll go back to Manuel a bit later. I just wanted to bring a bit of reality now into all these nice wishes that we have. And that's the IGF, and that's how it works at the IGF. And this year it's Parzane in these shoes. I don't want to ask you anything. You just say whatever you think you should. Hi. Uh, my name is Farzane Baidi. I'm doing remote participation coordination for this year, IGF 2013. Farzane Baidi. You probably know me, transcribers. Um, so I have three points to make. Um, of course, I have 100 to make, but I'm not going to make that, don't worry, here. Uh, people with disability, if we are talking about equal footing and a process that includes everyone on equal footing, then 
people with disability that want to participate remotely should have the same situation, the same uh, help as other people. We cannot say, oh, they can just call and pay because the remote participants that are not disabled, they can come freely. So we cannot say that. We cannot also say they can get assistance because they want to be independent. Independence is important for everyone and we have to provide them that. This, this is one point to make. We, we need to provide a platform that includes them equally with other remote participants. The other point is time difference. So you notice that in many of the rooms this year, you did not see many remote participants. One of the reason, that's one of the reason, uh, among all other technical and other difficulties, is time difference. And we wanted to have asynchronous remote hubs that they would sit together and discuss, and then they would send us their comments and questions. We did not pull that project off. That's another failed project. Then, also, the, the third point I want to make is about remote participants. You know, when you want to go to a conference physically, you get ready, you take a shower, and then, you know, you put your shoes on, and, and then you don't, you don't just get out of bed and go to the conference, are you, do you? Remote participants are also, should also be ready. They should read, they should know where they want to go. If they don't know, they should ask. We are ready to respond. Of course, maybe sometimes we overlook emails, but we are ready to respond. So contact us, tell us what you need. Prepare before the conference. Read the workshops. If you want to comment on them, read the background paper. Get information so that you can comment, so that you can contribute and, and uh, test your system. These are three comments. Of course, I have more, but I'm not going to tell. <laughs> and I think the, the, the point about prepare for the IJF is definitely not only for the remote participant, but for everyone, because many people do not really prepare and, and read about it. Emmanuel. Um, my name is Emmanuel Edet from Nigeria. Um, <laughs> okay. I used to be a lecturer in Diplo Foundation, and then that was my student, the most, the most stubborn student I had. Anyway, um, the issue of remote participation is quite interesting because um, in terms of affordability, Traveling across time zones for this kind of conferences um, are a bit difficult or is a bit difficult because of unavailability of funds. Having said that, I believe that most of the challenges we are facing um, in the area of remote participation can be cured through training and uh, provision of the technical tools where the funds are available. But the issue of the time zone cannot be cured. It's, we can't shift time zones. It, it will always be a challenge. So my suggestion would be, um, like the last speaker, I apologize, I didn't get her name. Uh, why don't we set up facilities where people can actually read up the contents of a workshop, prepare contributions, and make them available before the workshop so that even if they are in their bed sleeping or doing something else, like we, we watch Ginger's video, we could also get these contributions done irrespective of the time zone. I think that's, that will also help a lot. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Oh, one more thing, please. Sorry. Uh, on these principles, I think we should try and be flexible because... Um, it's not one site fits all. We should try and consider those in emerging markets that may not have the kind of bandwidth or may not have the kind of facilities that require active visual participation remotely. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Manuel. Uh, and I think this, this thing with the time zones, Ginger mentioned at the beginning in her video, by the way, she recorded a video because she didn't want to wake up. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, she mentioned that, that it might be a couple of uh, preparation, different coordinations on, on, a, on a regional level and then feed into the global process, whatever. And, and by the way, I think it's, it's much harder to ginger over there. She's in our time zone as well as in her. And we are just only in our time zone here. We can go to sleep at the end of the day. Uh, I wanted to call up on, on Guy if he's, if he's with us now. Uh, and it's interesting observation that I approached the Edre and said, tell Guy that he's the next one. I don't know if I was supposed to do that because he's a remote participant. It might be easier for him to know that he's the next one on the, on, uh, on the road. But I think I would approach any one of you and say, okay, you're the next one. Uh, Guy, can you, can you hear us? Can you jump in? And um, for for having me participate in this meeting, I've been following it since the beginning of the session, and I found uh, the um, the discussions very very uh, very illuminating and also uh, uh, interesting. I think we faced a lot of these um, issues at the ITU. We started a, a remote participation um, project at the ITU about the three or four years ago, I recently left the ITU, but um, this program became quite an important one. And all the sort of issues that we're discussing here, we also were discussing at the ITU. I think the interesting thing is, is that we were, you know, there is a community out there, everyone trying to tackle these issues. I think, um, I'm just going to make a short intervention. I think that there are three important things that we learn. I think the first thing is that you need to be realistic. Um, I don't think you, you can underestimate the complexity of what you're trying to do with remote participation. I think um, we've seen here, it's very difficult to, um, to take these two worlds and to bring them together successfully. Uh, it takes a lot of time, a lot of technical preparation to do that um, in order to make sure that the, you, you have the, we've worked out the audio issues, you work out the video issues that people can follow the part, the the the, um, the conference and can make interventions seamlessly. It's really not an easy thing to do. And I think when you're when you when you're sort of putting together a wish list, you need to think about the fact that each of those um, each time you add something to that wish list, you're making it more complex. So I think you're going to have to be. Everyone needs to be a little bit realistic about what what you can achieve within the budget constraints that we have now. Um, the second thing is I think that um, you need to um, focus, uh, have an objective about what you really want to achieve. I think in the ITU, the rule we came up with is that we need to give preference to delegates who are physically present. And when I say preference, what I mean by that is that um, we, the, the sort of golden rule, because it, these, are, these were quite formal meetings, um, is that you don't disrupt the physical meeting. The delegates at the ITU have very little tolerance for audio issues, uh, people saying, can you hear me, and all these things. So if the physical meeting was degraded, um, really that would, would jeopardize the whole remote participation progress. So we have to protect the physical meetings. And I think the, the, probably the key to the success of the, the meetings was um, what I call the training of the remote um, moderators. And these were often students that we would find, and we would train these students to, to be the interface between the, um, between the physical meeting and the remote participants. 
And by that, what they would do is they would um, queue up the, rem the, the remote participant. They would make sure that their audio was tested and they would then make sure that the, the interaction between the physical meeting and the remote uh, meeting went as, as seamlessly as possible. That's not to say we didn't have technical problems. Of course we did. But I'm saying in that context and in a formal UN type environment, um, the, the, the appetite for, for experimentation in these me type of meetings is, is very limited. So we had to do a lot of preparation to, to make sure to minimize these possible glitches. And I think that the remote participating moderators can do a lot to try and bring these two worlds together. I think you can do a lot in terms of uh, in using sort of what I would call narrow bandwidth technologies. I made the point earlier about the fact that at the moment we can see the people in the room. I'm participating remotely and I have a very good sense of the audience. But unfortunately, we have no back channel. And I think if we could put this together, in other words, if we could have a common chat space for all participants, that would help to meld these, these, these two worlds. So um, I don't want to go on any longer. I think these are the three things that you may need to think about to, when you're preparing these guidelines. It's first to you know, keep, it, keep it simple to a certain extent because there will be budgetary constraints. And every time you add a complexity, it, it makes it more difficult to, 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 to run the meetings and it adds the cost. And uh, the second thing is to really look at the, um, the, the role of the remote participation moderators. And thirdly, you know, to what extent do you want to try and protect the physical meetings so that it can to carry on in a seamless way? One point which I didn't mention, which I did mention in the chat message, is that if at, at, in these meetings, in the IGF meetings, the language is, sorry, we are using English only, which makes it a lot simpler. I think if you... If you, if you don't have to worry about multiple languages, then that, that's great. Because when you go into the multiple language uh, scenario, then it becomes far more complex and far more costly. Okay, I'll end my intervention there. Thank you. Put on the mic. Okay, mic is on. Thank you, Guy. I think I would have a number of questions to get back to you, but the, the time is almost up. We'll have another comment. Okay, we, we will have Dipendra for the, for the last comment before. Uh, Guy, was, it was really precious experience you shared with us from, from another UN uh, body, the ITU, with, with a lot of complexity besides the UNESCO, which we've heard about. And I know you might envy us because we are in Bali with beach, but we envy you because you have windows in your room and we don't have windows, fortunately, because we would see the beach otherwise. Uh, I don't know if we have Dipendra on the line. Dipendra, can you hear us? Dipendra is on the phone. Is Dipendra, can you hear us? I don't know. Yes. yes. Can you hear us, Dipendra? Seems we can get the connection. But okay. Let's. Our time, time is almost, almost off. off. I, I wanted want to. Uh, can, can you switch, switch off, off the tone and where wherever it is? Okay, thanks. Um, I wanted to give just one last comment for finalizing. Yep, yeah, I've asked Farzana when we started because we were late waiting for the other participant, remote participants to get connected to the system. She said, don't worry, you can take 20 minutes more or even more because we had, we had issues. But it is a specific situation. As a wrap up, I wanted to give uh, uh, also a, a microphone to Bernard, who was basically behind the implementation of most of the remote participation thus far, together with the remote participation working group, uh, to maybe try to f wrap up the discussion to consolidate our nice wishes and the practice, which is not really always that simple. Bernard, you can join remote, remotely or, or uh, with a microphone, whatever you prefer. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Yes
you have a camera over there. Yes, exactly. There you go. Thank you. I hope the remote participants can hear me. My name is Bernard Sadaka. I've been doing remote participation for the last four years for the IGF Secretariat, as well as Eurodeg, as well as I help UNESCO. So um, I have small bullet points I'd like to share with you. Um, one, there's no problems in remote participation. There are challenges. And from my perspective, I've faced lots of challenges like during the last four years, and I hope uh, okay, the captioning is working. Uh, one is that the lack of resources, we've already talked about that. Uh, from the perspective of the organizer, there's not, not much return of invest, but we all agree in this room that there is a huge return of invest for remote participation. So we need to convene this idea to uh, organizations uh, which are probably outside the IG um, uh, domain, so that they also use remote participation, but as well as convince the current IG organizations that they need to invest more into internet governance to push more resources. My second challenge is awareness. And here I'm talking about awareness for the organizers of the sessions that they understand how remote participation works and how to actually make it work because the success of remote participation is not only about remote participants or remote panelists or the remote moderator. It's also about the moderator of the session giving the floor for remote participants just as we're doing, just as we are doing in this session. So um, the other part of awareness, and I hope the captioning is, is working now, cool, is online awareness. People need to know that remote participation is working, will work, and will continue working. Okay? They need to know that it exists. Some people say, ah, oh, there's remote participation. I didn't know. You know. So they need to know about it. And remote participation is not only what we are seeing on the screen right now. Remote participation is Twitter, Facebook, social media, People reporting what is happening in the room, what is happening behind the room, what is happening on the roof, uh, as my my friend Nana said in the bathroom. If if you no, I'm joking. <laughs> if the person have gate to wait, this is the kind of remote participation that we are looking at. Not only chat and and and, and audio in the room. Um, the the third problem, uh, sorry, challenge, is that remote participation has a higher risk of failure. If someone tries to connect remote participation and cannot connect, they will leave the room. And I give the example of this session. Uh, someone called Abbe Brown joined the session. She or he couldn't hear the voice or sound of this session and then left after five minutes, unfortunately. So these are the challenges uh, in remote participation. But then you, you, you say that, oh, okay, these are all technological Limit. There, this is technological limits, and I'll tell you, no. These are, <clears throat> first there is machine uh, factors, like uh, the browser we're using, the operating system we're using, the software we need to install, uh, the hardware maybe not compatible, but there's also the human factor. And the human factor here is mo most important. I talked already about the aw awareness. We need, as Farzane spoke, we need readiness. Um, but we also need protocols. At the moment, there's no such thing as a remote participation protocol. There's no RFC, there's no ISO, there's no nothing. Nobody says how it functions. Nobody knows how it's supposed to function. And we, this, is, this is a huge, huge space we need to explore and we need to work on. Of course, I'm not mentioning the, uh, the new development of softwares, which, which brings me to my uh, before last idea, the user experience is the most important uh, topic that we need to build on in remote participation. People feedback on how remote participation worked or didn't work, this is what we need to build on. And which brings me to my last point, how do we need to adapt, how can we adapt in order to, pro to, to fix the glitches that are happening because basically remote participation could not work and we need to fix it, right? So, first we need to prepare, as we said before, uh, 
try and test in advance. But most importantly, as I said, evaluate. We need to evaluate what is happening, build on it, and evolve. And I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you know how the remote participation have evolved during the last few years. We started simple Skype and then dim dim and then, you know, and now we're using WebEx. So prepare, evaluate, and evolve. And hopefully within the next few years, we're going to have a better model, better framework. And I mean, I remember in, in, in WSIS Plus 10 at UNESCO, we actually had APNIC 35 in February connected remotely to UNESCO, to the WSIS Plus 10, and WSIS Plus 10 was connected remotely to APNIC 35. So we had two parallel events at the same time connected remotely, each one of them in a different platform because um, APNIC was using uh, uh, Adobe Connect. And it was amazing. It was the first time that this thing happened, and it actually worked. And the people from APNIC were like so happy, and, and, and as, as well as WSIS. So to conclude my, 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 uh, my thoughts, um, we need resources, we need awareness, we should remove the high risk of failure, we need to work on machine factors as well as human factors, we need to prepare, evaluate, and evolve the way we think about remote participation and the way forward to give it, and most certainly we need to write some protocols and some procedures on how it should work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernard. I think we are making a record with uh, breaking the time. Last sentence, and then we finish. Last word to Ginger, who says, sorry, sorry, sorry. Please invite everyone to continue on the Etherpad to make comments, chat comments, and edits, or to contact me by email, especially Bernard, to include their feedback as we work towards some principles and a protocol. She took my closing sentence. Here is the link. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Ginger, for pushing all of that. And the email address is? Virginia P. at diplomacy.edu. Well, I think you can just Google Ginger and you will find her. Thank you all for coming. And, and we go on working on this document and finalize it. Thank you. <laughs>